So my name is James O'Connor, and my name is Christian Lesko, and this is our summer 2020 internship presentation. So throughout the course of our 2020 summer internship, we worked primarily on one project, and that project was the Thermoseal Drum Pump Project. And uh, we worked with Thermoseal and ACME Machinery, which uh, ACME's, ACME Machinery is a subsidiary of Thermoseal, and they, uh, we pretty much just designed their uh, spray foam installation equipment for them. Uh, because they had been working with a machine shop, and uh, the machine shop doubled their prices on them, and then it just wasn't practical to keep on working with the machine shop. And so then, because the machine shop owned the intellectual property of all of the machinery that they had been making, they had to go to someone else to uh, prototype and design the machinery. So before we get into kind of the hardware that we actually developed, I want to talk a little bit about the spray foam insulation industry and kind of you know, what spray foam insulation is. And pretty much you have three main types of insulation when it comes to housing. You have fiberglass insulation, which you, you should be all pretty familiar with, just this pink cotton candy like looking um, material. And next you have cellulose insulation, which is a bit more expensive than fiberglass insulation, but it still can do a better job sealing as far as you know heat transfer. But it's a, it does about the same as fiberglass. And finally, you have foam insulation, which is going to be your most expensive option. However, because it's a liquid and it sprays in between the cracks that like fiberglass and cellulose can't get to, it actually does a better job of sealing and it creates an air barrier which prevents you from losing heat through convection with your house. And just some benefits from using spray foam insulation, number one, like I had mentioned, you're not losing heat through convection, so you're actually saving on energy costs. And Thermosu had quoted up to 50%, which is kind of uh, ambitious, if you ask me, but that's what they were saying. I'm assuming if you had a, a poor insulation job done before and you're replacing that. Also, it increases your structural integrity of your building because you're thickening the layers between your walls, and that creates a cushion, so your building is going to be a little stronger. And also, it helps reduce sound from, let's say you live near a highway and you want to avoid seeing trucks pass all night. You know, it kind of, it'll reduce the sound coming through your walls. And this is what the hardware that they asked us to design looks like. So you have these two drum pumps on the side and this main proportioner. And those two things we were asked to reverse engineer. And so here you can see the three models that we made in the center. You can see the proportioner, and then uh, you can see the two pumps in each drum. And uh, pretty much the way the system works, yes, Mr. Bond? Why are there two drums? Uh, so there are two drums because there's two separate chemicals that are going into the system. Uh, they call them A and B, um, and that's because depending on uh, just the properties that you want your insulation to have, uh, they use different chemicals. And so, um, yes, yeah, so that's why there's two pumps. And so uh, it goes into each end of the proportioner, uh, from one from this end and then the other chemical into the other end. And then, uh, yeah, so here you can see the front of the proportioner. And if you see uh, the manifold, which is, that's that part right there, uh, that's where all of the chemicals actually end up coming out. They haven't mixed yet, um, but that comes later. And then, uh, yeah, you see here, after it goes through the portioner, which you saw last, it goes into this heat exchanger. And this is pretty much just a solid aluminum block that the machine holds through. And here's kind of a view to get a look at the inside. If you look at these four ports here, those are actually where they insert um, metal heating rods that go the entire length of the heat exchanger. And those heat the entire block, which then heats the fluid going, going through of the heat exchanger. Here you can see a short video of the installation process of the spray foam. Um, in the video, as you can see, uh, there's a nozzle, and it's not until the nozzle that the two chemicals actually mix, because they react so quickly that if they mix in the system, it could definitely jam up the system and it wouldn't work anymore. So kind of getting more into the nitty gritty of the design of the system, here is one of the dynamite drum pumps that we reverse engineered. And this is characterized by a pneumatic pump up the top, as you can see. 
two ball check balls at the bottom and also a piston at the bottom as well. I just want to make it clear for the audience that <clears throat> when we use the term reverse engineer, that basically these two companies got together and the company we're working for designed this pump system originally. Yeah. Through sloppy uh, handling of the business arrangement, the machine shop that was just making their design ended up with the intellectual property. Mm -hmm. Okay, it was just sloppy business. So they asked for the intellectual property back and the machine shop said no and then they were sold to a larger competitor and then the price doubled and, um, and, and so we didn't reverse engineer something like uh, our Asian friends that like sending viruses over here. We uh, basically restored the intellectual property and made improvements for the company that originally designed it. Yes, exactly. Thank you, Mr. Mon. Yes. Right. So on the next slide, we have a uh, short video showing how the pneumatic piston uh, works. And so as you can see in the video, uh, air comes in this inlet down here, and it goes up in here and pushes the piston up until it reaches the spring. And then once it reaches the spring, this uh, valve is just opens up, and then the air is allowed into this portion up here. And then once that happens, um, it pushes the piston back down where it reaches this spring up here, which opens the little uh, cylinder the other way, uh, the valve the other way, and then it creates a reciprocating pneumatic piston. And then this video right here, um, you can see that when the piston is actuating up, it sucks up whatever fluid. Uh, either the A or the B chemical into this little compartment right there. And then as the piston actuates down in this video, uh, the fluid is pushed up in here. It goes up through here and then into the proportioner. So next, getting into more of the design as well. Um, here's a section view of one of the drum pumps. And what we found when we were going through is that there were four non-standardized O-ring boss seals in this design and also one missing o-ring boss seal and thermal seal had complained to us saying that these pumps sometimes only really last a couple months and have thrown away and order new ones so with a turnover rate that bad it, it seemed to us that there was a flaw in the design and they had mentioned they thought that some of these springs might be there but when we took a closer look the springs were just switching the direction that the valve was um, open it just switched the direction of flow so that really was didn't seem to be the problem and when I take a closer look at this, this O-ring boss seal, it seemed to me that you were losing pressure through the system at the top of the, the pump, and that's probably why it wasn't performing well. It might have been causing damages. So I, I added an O-ring boss seal there. And if you're not familiar with what an O-ring boss seal is, this is the general idea. You have one male threaded end that goes into a female threaded end. And there's an O-ring that sits at the top of these threads with a special groove that's placed, that's machined into the threads. And there's also a chamfer machined into the female threads that helps give a certain uh, compression squeeze on the O-ring that prevents fluid or air from leaking out. And this is an, a real life example of what that would look like. This is a male end that would thread into a female port. So this is a screenshot of a page in the Parker Handbook. And as you can see, everything for O-ring boss seals are specified. You know, wh whether it be the thread type or whether it be the, um, the chamfer that goes on the end of the thread, like the fillets, everything is specified. And in our design, as I had pointed out before, there were four that were non-standardized. So I want to point out this F dimension up here and also this D dimension, because those will come in handy in the next slide. What I did to kind of figure out you know exactly what had to happen for the designs and what, how to find out the dimensions that were required um, to get the right compression squeeze that we needed for this, these ports was I took the data from the Parker Hannafin handbook and I put it in an Excel file and I took the O-ring inner diameter and I plotted it against the groove outer diameter and I noticed that there was a linear trend line between the two 
and I, I plotted a linear equation, or I formed a linear equation to that line, and I noticed that it, it followed pretty, pretty closely to where the data point should be, but it wasn't exactly linear, so I plotted um, a polynomial to it. And then I also did the same thing for the female port, except with the O-ring outer diameter and the D-dimension that I put on the last page. Then I took those equations and I plugged them in here at the bottom, and I calculated what we should expect from the non-standardized O-rings, those dimensions. So I calculated the D-dimension and, and the male F-dimension. And on top of that, to kind of see how much compression squeeze we should expect, which is uh, how much the O-ring is squeezed divided by the cross-section of the O-ring, I we calculated it out and we found that the compression squeeze for these dimensions should give us between like 27 and 28 percent, and you want between 25 and 30. So it was right in the middle and a perfect balance of compression squeeze, which tells us that this design is like, good to go and it should work. So that's what I did to you know calculate these non-standardized scoring boss dimensions. And so here we have a more in-depth look at the uh, drum pump. And so the drum pump uh, proportioner is characterized by a hydraulic pump in the center, a piston on uh, each end, which is used to draw the fluid, and then a check valve, which uh, that prevents any backflow in the system. And then the, uh, the hose manifold, which that's where the chemicals eventually come out and go into the hoses, which are used for insulation. Then you have the GSL fluid chamber. And on the back, there's the directional control valve. And the directional control valve is used for the hydraulic fluid, which actuates the uh, hydraulic cylinder. Then you have the hydraulic manifold, band cap. And so I'm going to kind of go through how the portion actually works and how the fluid actually flows through the system. First, you have a limit switch on both sides and when this one reaches a limit switch sensor on this side, it will switch the direction that the hydraulic fluid is flowing through the directional control valve. Next, the hydraulic fluid going through the directional control valve flows into the compressed hydraulic fluid chamber side, which begins the process of pushing the, the piston to the opposite side of the chamber. Uh, and there's also chemical built up from the last cycle in this um, chamber right here between the check valves. So after all that happens, the shaft and the whole subassembly moves over to the opposite side. And the chemical that was in this chamber now flows through the check valve into the end cap chamber. And on the opposite side, the fluid that was contained in the end, in the end cap chamber is pumped out of the proportioner into the heat exchanger at approximately 3,000 psi. And that's when the opposite limit switch sensor is activated, it flips the flow of hydraulic fluid from the directional control valve, and you have a reciprocating pump. Okay. Alright, so now we're going to just kind of outline the process that we took to uh, just complete this project. And so the first step was disassembly and discovery. And so, I mean, looking at the outside of the proportioner, you can't really tell that much. And so obviously we had to take it apart. And like taking it apart, we discovered just how intricate it actually was and how much was going on inside. And uh, we were able also to go to Norwalk and uh, take a look at some actual uh, some actual parts and the machinery that was used to install the spray foam insulation. And we were also able to talk to a uh, representative of the company that we were doing the project for, uh, who was able to explain the system in depth to us, which uh, just really just helped us throughout the rest of the project. We were able to get a video while we were there, um, and we were able to just go back and reference that if we ever had any questions about the actual process that the fluid went through to get from point A in the drum pump, in the drums and all the way out to the hoses. So the next step in the process for us was, after we figured out how everything worked, we sat down and started measuring the components and started putting it into CAD. And all of the components that you see, you've see you seen in the drum pump or in the portioner were all product models that we made ourselves from scratch. 
And here's kind of a video showing an exploded view of you know, what that looks like and all the parts we actually used. We also included the different seals that we use in the assembly. And you know, the exploded view kind of just shows all the details, including the screws and everything that, that goes into just the portion alone. Um, so after we had everything catted up and modeled, um, we took the seals and we standardized and specified you know, exactly which seals that we used. So while we were making the models, we said, okay, we have you know, an O-ring here, or we have a rod wiper here, and we specified, okay, we're using this manufacturer, this is the part number, this is the material that's made from. Uh, typically, in a hydraulic, like a normal hydraulic system, you have several different types of seals that are accomplishing different purposes. If you look over here on the piston side, you have a piston seal, which pretty much creates an airtight seal between the hydraulic fluid chambers, which prevents pressure going between one chamber to the other so you can maintain force, and also just preventing the mixing of the different fluids in the chamber. You have a wear ring on the piston as well, and that prevents metal to metal contact between the piston and the, the chamber encasing it. Um, we also have rod wipers, which prevent dirt or contamination from coming off the rod and going into the hydraulic chamber. And also a rod seal, which kind of just, again, makes sure no fluid is coming out of the hydraulic system and going out you know, from the rod into the, the outside air. And again, just prevents contamination going back and forth. We did not have a buffer seal, and we did have several static seals of O-rings, you know, throughout the portioner and throughout the drum cone. We decided to go with one manufacturer primarily for our different seals. So whether that be for the hydraulic fluid seals or for the O-ring seals, we chose Parker Hannafin you know, to be our manufacturer because in case we had any conflicting dimensions, using the same manufacturer, it should be consistent across the board. Here's kind of an example of you know, one of the spec sheets that we referenced going through a hydraulic seal. This is a poly pack. What this does is it's actually, it would act as this rod seal right here. It just prevents hydraulic fluid from leaking, you know, again, like I was saying, from the chamber to the outside world. And it gives different things from, you know, you take your diameter and you select you know exactly which seal you want, and it gives you tolerances for the different parts which we include in our drawings. Uh, again, like I was saying, we use several O-rings referencing the Parker Hanfin, Parker Hanfin O-ring handbook, and they also provided all the tolerances required, and they even specified the fillets and chamfers in the groove itself. So we used them in designing all of our O-ring glands and grooves. The only other manufacturer we used besides Parker for our seals was called Halite, and that reason was because we found the exact same hydraulic piston seal that they use in the portion of reverse engineering, so we figured we might as well keep it consistent. We use the exact same seal. And we also specified different hardware, mainly like retaining rings or like screws and things like that. And finally, the last step in our process was making 2D drawings and you know, documenting everything. So we actually have a handbook of all the different seals that we used in the, the portioner and the trunk pump. And Christian's gonna kind of you know, hand those back to you guys and take a look and kind of see our thought process and how we um, specified oh, those different uh, seals. And again, like I was saying, every single component that we designed, we made from scratch. And everything that we did, all the thought process, the whole thought process, um, the different tolerances, the names for the seals, everything like that concerning each component, we made drawings for every single one of those parts. And here's kind of an example of what that looks like. You have a piece from the portioner here and a piece from the drum pump here. And this includes, again, like I was saying, all the tolerances specified in the handbook. And um, we just went through and made sure everything was down to a T, you know, a fine tooth comb, and just make sure that we got everything down. And finally, we're in the process right now of making manuals. Um, Christian started it, and once he leaves, I'll be taking on that responsibility. And that sums up the Thermoxo Jump Pump project. All right, and then a secondary, uh, smaller project that I was working on throughout the course of this 
was uh, the NASA project, uh, which I worked on with Dan and Gestapo. And uh, so for that, I was, we work on a project for the Glenn Research Center, which is located in Cleveland, Ohio. And uh, what they do is they develop tech uh, for use in aeronautics and the space industry. And uh, pretty much, uh, so in this burner, in this uh, assembly right here, the flow of oxygen comes in through here. And then there's three chambers right here. There's this chamber, this chamber, and then another chamber located behind it. And uh, so the flow of air is mixed with gas that comes from in here and then goes into these nozzles that comes in the top right here. And then it combusts in there. Except for uh, when they didn't have a lot of oxygen going in, the flame was going out. And so pretty much they wanted to be able to use less oxygen and still have the flame going uh, at the same time just to improve efficiency. And so they recognized uh, preferred skill and burner technology and so they came to us and asked us for help with that. And uh, this is the part that I primarily worked on. It's called the combustion can. Um, so you have this outer case in here and then you have the uh, inner liner, which is mainly what I worked on. Um, originally, uh, this right here was modeled using the 3D scanner that some of you may have heard about uh, that we've recently been using. Um, but so the way that that worked, it created a lot of tiny triangular faces, um, which was good enough. It showed kind of the characteristics of what was going on. But uh, Gustavo had to run a fluid dynamics test on it. And when he was running it, just because uh, the way the software works, it just wasn't working with the smaller triangles. And so he asked me to make a 3D model um, of the inside liner. And so I made a 3D model of the inside liner. And then he actually was able to test that recently. And uh, with data given to him from NASA, he was able to see that the model that I made accurately uh, portrayed what was going on uh, during the combustion process. And so he's going to move forward. And then they're going to make improvements on that so that uh, they can use less oxygen and be more efficient while they're using it. And uh, that concludes our presentation. Thank you guys for your attention. Are there any questions? How much did we change, or uh, what did we add to the, uh, the pump project? So like I was saying with the, um, the missing iron boss seal, and they also had a couple smaller changes that they wanted us to make. Actually, can I see that with I'm going to flip back a little bit to the portioner and show you the manifold. Yes. Yeah, that was good. So, they had asked us to move, there's a TSL fluid chamber port in the yeah. bottom that's kind of angled out, and they pretty much just asked us to move that to the very bottom. So, we made that change. And also, with the manifold here, they asked us to extend this front section out about like an, a half inch or an inch or so because they mentioned they're putting on these uh, gauges that were hitting the body of the portioner. So they just wanted that moved out of the way. But besides that, we kept everything pretty like, consistent with what they wanted. And then, again, like I mentioned with the drum pump, yeah, it just changing stuff. There was also a, in the drum pump, they had an O-ring seal at the top that was acting as the um, the main pneumatic seal, and we changed it to an actual pneumatic seal, so that should improve the performance of the pump. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Good. Were, yes, sir. Were you guys able to get everything quoted out and build the bill of material and find out what, our, what the cost will be and compare that to what they were paying? Um, I know. I don't think we actually priced out like the price of manufacturing it, but I know we worked with them on getting a price for prototyping. But as far as manufacturing, we haven't gotten there yet. So they they were paying like uh, fifteen or sixteen hundred dollars for that the that pump there, right. and then it got pushed up to thirty five hundred dollars. Wow. Right. Yeah. So um, uh, because the the company was acquired, so uh, you know, I think I I don't know. I mean. I don't know what the cost of this thing is. Yeah, it, I mean, we gave them the prototype cost, so we have a stack of drawings. And we have, right. Once, once we all agree that uh, this is the design we want, right. then we're going to be able to quote each individual part on how much time it will take, and then, okay. then we can give it a formal dollar quote and see yeah. if that makes sense. Right. So is that the, is that the goal, is that we become their supplier of the comps? No, that 
that was not internet. Yeah, I, I, the goal the goal was to be able to reclaim their intellectual property, mm -hmm. and then uh, make it so that they might go out to some outside machine shop again. Yeah. Of course, doing a better job this time, hopefully, of having NDAs and all this bit in place. Um, uh, but. I think they also wanted up to see if we would do it because I think that they feel that we're a little more reputable. But I, I just don't know if we're set up to do this cost effectively for them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Thank you, guys. Yeah. Hi. Um, I'm Olivia. I'm a guest here. Um, I found this very interesting. If you guys ever want to test out a marriage, you insulate your garage together with your husband. <laughs> I, I just did this really recently. Um, we put in radiant floor overhead, and one of the, our options was spray foam, and I didn't know much about it, so we did buy spray foam, and our power pack was refrigerant. Mm -hmm. So we only did overhead, so it wasn't that big a space, and we bought two units, and they were really expensive. They were they were part A and part B as well, and they were mm -hmm. 750 a shot, so it's, 1500 just for the overhead oh, wow. but you know that was really interesting to see if you know if you know that's the the refrigerant we have which is 30 pound bottle so it wasn't that mm -hmm. big but you know listening to you guys discuss the cost the price and I just didn't realize how expensive refrigerants were coming mean, refrigerants uh, installations were mm -hmm. but yeah. if it's going to keep me warm in the winter time oh. spend away <laughs> oh, yeah. the, 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 the liquid the, it's it's the chemical yeah. And they're proprietary, so mm -hmm. you know, they. That's why it costs so much. The other stuff is, um, you know, in comparison, so cheap. Mm -hmm. it's, it's yeah, you can really specialize with the different chemicals you put in. You know, mm -hmm. well, depending on what you're going for, you can really specialize. Yeah, and I didn't think that, I didn't know about the the enhancing the structural integrity mm -hmm. by yeah. by doing it too. I didn't know that either. Of, of course, for me. Uh, and Chuck, yes, for me and Chuck, and maybe Rob, the thought of making a house like a thermos bottle and not having it breathe, breathe at all is gives me a little claustrophobia. <laughs> but, um, and it's not healthy. So if you do this to like every surface on the inside of a house, you have to have an air exchange system yeah. um, that's battery backed up. Otherwise, yeah. you know, it's just, I don't, I don't know. I mean, it's something that would be great to do to your ceiling on the top floor of your house, between your house and the roof. Great. But I don't know that I would do the entire interior of my house like this. So it would help keep moisture out, too, you know, especially on the roof. Yeah. Especially if you have a gas stove. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah just keep the CO in. Um, okay. Uh, excellent. That's a great start. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, thank you. Thank you. summer I was in the field engineering and project manager, manager position. I uh, consist of working with Alex Canny, uh, Northern New England sales manager, and Charles Ouellette. He's a service tech also in New England. Uh, most days I was at a different job site or facility around New England. I was in Boston most days, New Hampshire, Maine, um, Connecticut a little bit. Here's a list of some of the sites I was at. Mostly fuel oil and boilers. Broken men too, those two divisions, I guess you could say. The top is Franklin Memorial Hospital in Maine. We did the 
controls and fuel oil for the boilers there a while ago. They had some problems with that. I was there last week. And then below we have Boston College where they recently put burners in there. Um, other than a brief description from Charles and uh, Alex, I didn't really know too much going in each day, so, but uh, I enjoyed that difficulty of trying to figure out the system and then help with solving the problem. Uh, it required a lot of troubleshooting techniques. These are some of the questions I would ask myself to try to organize my brain and assist Charles and Alex. Uh, here we have MIT Site 5. They had two uh, emergency generators on the roof that they were installing. It's a new building. And we were doing the controls for the day tanks up there. Uh, they had a lot of problems there, so I probably asked these questions to myself like 30 times. But uh, their pumps were only coming on in manual, not auto, and they were blind. They thought it was our uh, our controls not sending a call to the pumps downstairs. It ended up being a, an emergency stop downstairs in the basement that didn't nobody knew it was on. There was no alarm, so it was kind of confusing trying to figure that out. And here we had some solenoid valves that were wired incor incorrectly. They're backwards and normally open, normally closed, or switched around, so they couldn't get fuel to that day tank. And then we, here we have some level indicators that were reading correctly as well. So we had to make sure those were set correctly in the bottom of the day tanks, and then we had to set some offsets on the, on the panels as well. And speaking of calibrations of the level indicator, I did that a lot. So calibration, simulating no value to establish a zero in span so equipment can be relied on to measure control. Um, other than the level indicator, I did the resistance temperature device, RTD, quite a bit. Differential pressure meter and flow meter. Used the multimeter a lot for that. We simulated the 4820 milliamp signal. So to the device and then it would appear on the analog and make sure it lined up. And then we adjust the zero in the span if there was problems with that. Um, here is, this is me at Eastern Connecticut State University in Connecticut, the differential pressure meter and RTD. Charles was really good at showing me how to do it and then he let me go about and uh, do on my own. That was really nice of him. And another product I used a lot or worked on a lot was the FSC, Flexible System Controller. Um, I know there's more that it can do than just this, but this is what I worked on a lot. So the net new, net, no net communication, again at MIT, those two generators each had uh, analogs and they're each, you could tell the level and there's an analog for each switch between the two. So they're communicating back and forth. Uh, we had to run wires between the two and help them land them. Uh, program changes on FSC as well. There's a USB port, SD card, and remotely at MIT, the program change and Archer Donahue as well. We had Paul Peterkin one time dial into the computer and remotely change the program. Uh, also with FSC, high low level alarm, level control, leak detection, and much more. I was impressed with the system flexibility and the adaptation, so if it's an older system, they can add changes to it over time. Uh, I was impressed with the see. Uh, also, the O2 sensor I deal with a lot at Tufts and Eastern Connecticut. It improves combustion by adjusting the fuel to air ratio directly related to the O2 trim. The zirconium oxide cell generates a 4 to 20 millivolt signal and it's directly related to the oxygen concentration in the fluid. It's mounted right exact on the exhaust, exhaust stack. I have that right on the pictures next. And we did calibration of these a lot. So there's a low test with two different tanks, one at 0.4 and one at 8%, and wait till it's at a consistent state. What job was that? Uh, here, I'll show you. So at Eastern Connecticut State. Okay. And then uh, also Tufts, we did the calibration as well. Okay. Uh, most of them went smoothly. They were reading correctly already, but this one on the left, you can see, it wasn't accepting the calibration. So we had to take the flange off, pressure tested it, and it still wasn't working correctly, so we, I, I think Charles is still working on that, but it's something going on with the cell. Um, it was good to, good to see those in, uh, working in person. And this is also very neat. We, on the way home from Franklin Memorial, we stopped by Bates College in Maine. 
you see the RFO, Renewable Fuel Oil Project. They converted two of our boilers to RFO. They were originally burning natural gas and number two oil. Uh, RFO is created from trees in a process called paralysis. It's the rapid heating of the wood oil or products in the absence of oxygen. Uh, when we were there, they had the covers off the boilers so you could see inside. And here's the tank that uh, the RFO is stored in. And this is the pre heaters over here. Uh, we have I'm sorry you didn't get to uh, be there when it was firing because it smells like a wonderful barbecue is going on. <laughs> That's what I've heard. <laughs> yeah. Um, I was impressed with it. It looks very similar to a normal fire tube boiler, even though it's very different fuel. Uh, soot blowers, Morrison tube and tube sheets. Soot blowers are cleaning the inside the tubes from soot. So you still have that thermal energy exchange, and and then the Morrison tube was neat. To see inside, and we had the so the burner would be on the opposite end of this. Gases of combustion flowing through, like the furnace, flowing back through these fire tubes for another pass and coming out on for the last pass up top here. Um, turn down ratio, which we saw a lot on our our burners. So I was impressed with how how high those were. Uh, the turnout ratio is the maximum to minimum heat output. It's more important in larger demand changes, so if you have uh, boilers turning on and off or pressure or temperature changes more, more often, that's important. But say you have a constant pressure and temperature, it wouldn't be as important for the never actually going to be turning off that, off that boiler. But with the turnout ratio, there's less thermal energy losses because there's not as many, because you're not fully purging boiler and losing all that heat and combustion gases and the high inrush current is limited so when you're starting up a boiler there's going to be a high inrush current for the uh, burner and controls and they that's limited because you're not, never actually turning off the boiler so I, to go back I've seen I've seen uh, well, the past two internships I was in a boiler plant at, at UMass I saw how Chiefs and uh, operators really like the turn down ratio, high turn down ratio. Uh, but there's many other players on a, that are involved in buying a burner or involved in buying a burner. So Alex helped me lay this out: the sales and service considerations for players involved in the whole process of buying a burner. So there's a lot of overlap, but service and sales. Here are the people for that are involved. Um, I won't explain every one of their intentions or roles, but I think it was important for me to understand who I'm talking to and what they are looking to get. Um, and general considerations, this is something I learned from Alex and Charles, and this is kind of how they treated those different players. So understanding the whole system, both Charles and Alex did a good job of, even if it wasn't our product, knowing what's going on in the system and not like turning turning away if it wasn't our product. So being an expert in fuel oil boilers, other equipment, whether it's the cars or not, and existing existing and new. And then more of the troubleshooting, again, be slow to assume cause of issue. It could be easy to be like that's that's not our not our problem, that's not our equipment, but it very well could be just not uh, seeing it right away. So observe the whole system interview everybody that's been on site or off site and then hold off all personal judgments until confirmed. Uh, more sales side of it, impression and performance impacts long term relationship. So building that conf confidence on site when you respond quickly. I know at Franklin Memorial in Maine, Charles or Alex got the call one day and we were up there the next day and that definitely gave them confidence for our responsiveness quick. And then staying on the job to complete can seem uh, like a simple one, but staying until the job's done is very important. And following up after completion, whether it's the next day or five years down the road, they call that. Uh, that's all I have. I will thank you for uh, listening and thank you for the opportunity. I'm still like a month left, but looking forward to it. <laughs> Any questions? Uh, so, when I mean I know that you weren't in the lead role when you were going in, but you you were you were working uh, uh, 
uh, with um, uh, the chiefs or you know the, the facility operators. Uh, is there one common thing that you could say that all of them were, uh, you know, looking for in a in a uh, engineering and service response from from any you know from us or anyone else? Uh, I don't know about a lot, a lot of things, but I think uh, I think the overall expert was a big uh, point. Like even Alex told me, he's like a lot of these boiler plants come in with. And there's a sales guy with a pamphlet, but say you come in and you and you know more about the system than they would expect the sales guy to see. I thought that was a, a big thing that Alex was able to do, and I think a lot of salespeople should be more knowledgeable on the operating side of things, and they'll be respected more by that chief or operator. Yeah, yeah, yeah I definitely think that, and and I think a close second to that is uh, that. <clears throat> these people are used to being let down all the time, technically and from a res and from a um, a responsiveness standpoint, and from a person that's willing to stick with the the issue. So often, people just kind of give up. They don't return phone calls. They don't uh, return emails. They said they were going to be back next week. They don't show up. They don't tell anyone they didn't show up. And really, what uh, differentiates us from the other people is uh, our ownership, our co-ownership with the uh, the end user of the equipment in their plant, and that's what we, you know, always try and uh, convey. And we always, what we're looking for in people to be field engineers for us um, is, uh, you know, is give making the customer understand that that's how we feel uh, about about the the project at hand and about their facility that their facility is as important uh, uh to us as it is to them so right i was impressed with that i, I know i went in kind of blindly we, right, we met on linkedin and went into the job but i was impressed so far with that that side of things with, with this company so. yeah good yeah. Great. Any other questions? Good. Yeah. Good. picture with everybody out in the boiler room when we get them. Hello everyone, uh, my name is Marshall Munsell and I want to talk to you about uh, the quality time I spent in quality control this summer. <laughs> nice. I thought that was pretty clever. <laughs> Before you go further, do you have a picture in this presentation of your finger when, when you got fried? Uh, that, no, but uh, I can find it. That other <laughs> internship. Not at preferred, but yeah, I okay. did almost yeah. Seriously, after okay. myself, I right. over <laughs> um, Yeah, so I worked out in QC with uh, Chris Camp. Um, got to learn a lot from him. He's, he knows what he's doing out there. And was, I've been really blessed to uh, have been out there with him and learn from him. Um, I'm going to break this presentation down into three sections. So the first is the inspection and testing process, uh, which is mainly what I've been doing out in QC. Um, I've kind of, my time here this summer, I've broken and been able to break down that process into three steps, uh, which I'll cover um, later on. Uh, most of the panels that come through are FSCs and uh, VMUs, um, and that's something that I've learned a lot about this summer as well. And then I've also done one or two side projects for Chris out in QC uh, that I'll briefly cover at the end. So inspection process. Um, I found 
the first step in inspecting panels is to go through and do a point to point. So the panel comes in from the electricians after they've wired it up, and then I go through, um, compare the panel to the drawing, I'll make sure that the wires are present where they need to be, that they're hooked up properly, um, that they're hooked up to the right places in the panel. Um, there's uh, field wiring and then the panel wiring done in the shop. Um, making sure that field wiring, field wiring isn't hooked up in the shop. Um, just being able to recognize that there's certain wiring, some of the diagrams um, can have mistakes in them not indicating whether or not the field wiring is actually field wiring. So just being able to recognize that, hey, this field box leak wiring shouldn't be marked as you know field wiring or vice versa. Um, so that's and, an engineering mistake. So no, noticing engineering mistakes, uh, being able to recognize that not just that not just because the wiring diagram says it's so means it's actually so. Right. Yes. Um, and then also just recognizing that. There should be stickers and labels in the panel, um, being able to recognize what stickers and labels need to be there um, and where they should be. Uh, the next step, so once I've gone through, I've made sure that the panel's wired up correctly. Um, I know that it's most likely safe to turn on, um, power on. Chris and I had a experience um, about halfway through the summer where one of the it was 480 uh, full panel, I believe. Um, one of the wirings had been wirings had been uh, flipped, um, and we were about to turn it on. And Chris took one last look at the panel and was like, "Wait, don't turn it on." Uh, if we had turned it on at that point, it probably would have blown up in our faces. So, just understanding that wiring is very important uh, for these panels. So then, uh, this step. Second step is powering it on, wiring it up, uh, putting in analog and digital inputs and outputs. Um, so this is where we hook up and test and simulate um, what the panel would be doing out in the field. So simulating the sensors and valves that would be wired up uh, there. So uh, once I've wired it up, I power it on. I make sure that all the inputs and outputs are working, that the OIT is reading those, um, detecting them. And then I upload the, well, um, for that also I have to upload the program. So I've, I've recently become pretty confident with that uh, process of being able to recognize and find those programs on the depth and then upload them to the panels. So mainly uh, FSC, OIT, uh, D4 programs. Uploading those, making sure they work, uh, checking out the inputs and outputs, and then the sequence of operations. Uh, being able to go through the panel and say the customer wants this to happen when this flips, get this switch gets flipped. Um, so going through making sure that actually uh, performs the way it should. Uh, so once I've gone through the program and that I'm now that I'm confident that it works properly, um, all the inputs and outputs are there, the wiring is good. Um, I can tear it down, uh, take all the wiring out, the field wiring that I simulated, um, and then clean the panel out and then fill out, I say paperwork, it's really one, one piece of paper, check some boxes, um, make sure all the stickers are in there, if there's uh, ground wiring is in there, um, and then I put some stickers on it with my name on it, which is kind of stressful. Um, <laughs> if I messed up this panel and it goes out in the field, you know, my name's on it, they can trace it back to me. Yeah. Um, but it's also keeping me alive, making sure I'm being thorough. Um, so put those stickers in, I get to do a high pot test, which I think is pretty fun. So bumping the, the panel with really high voltage. I haven't shocked myself on it yet, so I'm pretty thankful for that. Um, but that also just makes sure that not only are the wires connected to where they should be, but also that there's no like cuts or kinks in the wire um, that I wouldn't have noticed previously. And then I also take pictures of the panel um, and then send it over to shipping where they ship it off to the customer. Um, so then the FSC and BMUs are mainly what I've been working with. Um, I've seen a few BMUs, but more so a lot of uh, FSCs. I've been so really for those in the audience that aren't familiar, 
FSC stands for what? Fuel system controller is what I thought. You, Colby, you called it a flexible system controller. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not sure. Right. Are they uh, both? <laughs> it's supposed to be the flexible system controller. Okay. All right. That's that's the real name. Okay. Um, and then the BMU. BMU Burner Mate Universal. Okay. So um, we have sort of the heart of the control system for fuel systems, which is a PLC of our making. And then the Burnamate Universal is a multi-board controller that does combustion control, fuel air ratio control. Uh, it can do draft, O2, drum level, all of that stuff too. Uh, but it most importantly does combustion control and flame safeguard control in one, in one box, um, as opposed to a, a, a large cabinet with um, you know, other components. Yeah. For how compact it is, it's impressive how much you can do. Yeah, definitely. So I've mostly interacted with the FSCs, the Flexible Systems Controller. Um, as you know, they, it's capable of being hooked up to a larger network, no capabilities, which is something that's really uh, impressed me about uh, these panels here. Um, we have, I believe, two jobs out there right now that have uh, six or seven uh, FSCs all hooked up together talking. They're generally more complicated uh, to test, but I've enjoyed that process as well, working out there with Chris, um, making sure that node one is reading the same as like node 6, for example. Uh, the Burnham Rate Universal as well. I have read the manual for that uh, front to back, actually, this summer. There was a day where we were a little less busy out um, in the QC. So Chris gave me the privilege of going through that and um, reading it. There's a lot of information in there. I was really impressed with just the wide variety of sensors and the stuff that can be hooked up to it. I've also worked with uh, the VSDs and the VFDs, which are motor speed control. Well, they, they interact with the uh, motors, uh, and the VMU can talk to them and determine like motor speed and um, different settings on the motors uh, there. Uh, and then paired with that are the OITs and D4s, which are screens that display the information that the burner mate or the FSC is using and looking at. So the OIT is, we have a picture. So the OIT is this screen, it's a touch screen, uh, just displays more of the, uh, what pumps are on, you can see the inputs and outputs on that screen. And then the D4 here is used for tanks, that displays a level um, in the tanks. Um, it has a few error um, detection systems that it Yeah, so that was my experience with those. Um, I'm learning a lot about them, but there's more I learn about them, the more I'm realizing how little I know about them so far. There's there's a lot that they can do, and I've been pretty impressed with them. So, ideally, your internship would have been in two parts, and one would have been first, would have been like out in the field, mm -hmm. and then you would have come in and done this, and it would have made a lot more sense. I'm sure okay, so but in any case, you you know we all we got together a little late in the game, and the, you know we plugged you in here, and there's time to do other stuff if we wanted. And then also, uh, when I first started out, I wasn't as good with the program for testing, so Chris Payne did that. Um, but I had some free time. I helped out of the shop by making some new digital test boards. So I made, I believe, I made two of the bigger test boards, you can see up the top right, and then I made uh, three or four of the smaller switch boards down there. Uh, when I first started out, we had the bigger node, uh, FSC node um, systems that I mentioned earlier set up, and we had all them all wired up, which meant we used up most of our switches and fights for those. Um, so we were in need of some more around. So I made those. It was pretty fun, actually. I got to solder a lot. And, um, see my 
um, contribution to QC a little more quickly there. So yeah, like I said, my time in QC, um, it was great getting to learn the preferred process, quality control here at preferred, how they go about doing it. Um, I got to read some manuals. Um, again, Chris was a great help for me. He taught me a lot. Um, it's really nice having him out there, um, being able to ask him questions, um, and just learn from him. But it also learned just general knowledge about controls, wiring, being able to read diagrams. Um, I found that um, experience uh, very, very rewarding. Um, and then also just critical thinking. When I first started out, I looked at a panel and saw the wiring diagrams like, all right, point A needs to be at point A here. But now I can look at it and go, oh, that's a digital output. Um, does it match up with what is actually being hooked up to it um, in the panel? And also just asking, does this make sense? You know, I making sure that a light switch, or I'm sorry, a light, you don't want to hook it up to the hot because it's always going to be on. Um, you don't want to make sure that it's hooked up to the neutral and then the other point is hooked up to uh, the panel. Just understanding, making sense of what actually should be working. Um, yeah, that's my experience at QC. Very good questions. So w more of a statement than a question, but um, very often as humans, we want to just finish whatever we're working on. And um, in, a, in a school environment, you might turn something in and get a little bit lower grade because you, you missed something in a work environment, maybe from an engineering point of view, you, you leave a detail off of something, you know, in manufacturing, you know, you, you can land the wire wrong, whatever. I'm really happy that you had the critical thinking there at the end. Um, you know, QC really kind of forces you to be patient. And if you take that away from, from your experience and just everything you kind of do throughout life, you're just a little bit more patient and make sure what you're doing is complete. It'll just it'll help you for the rest of your life. Yeah, I also want to point out that Marshall, you know, Chris Camp uh, had to, he, he had to take last week off because he had to do his uh, home move and uh, stuff. And so Marshall was there with a little backup from Richard and, you know, uh, the, the regular backup crew. But I thought that was pretty good that he felt confident that he could leave Marshall keeping things moving forward. That was really a compliment to you. Just a comment relative to your 480 volt experience. You need any um, help? Any more healthy fear? Just YouTube uh, arc flash, arc flash videos. Yeah. See yeah. some interesting yeah. stuff there. Yeah, where like a guy doesn't even make contact really to get right. close enough. He still still be standing three feet in front of a panel. Yeah. And Art flash incident, you just see this gigantic flash of light explosion. And he and in the video he's wearing a you know a suit. Right. Um, but even still it's like it's a very powerful, scary thing. I, I had an experience, I was at a boiler manufacturer and, and someone hooked up uh, 480 volts incorrectly behind me and they powered up the panel and I wasn't even facing it, but it was behind me and, and the whole the whole panel exploded, shot molten metal up in the air and it was like yeah, it was raining copper. It was, right, it was raining copper. It was raining liquid copper. Right. And um, this is why I pray for all of our people every morning. <laughs> uh, Not to scare you, but I mean, it just it, it's good to have some healthy beer. I'm glad you were able to uh, yeah. experience that. Makes it more fun. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, good. All right. Well, thank you very much.
But first off, I uh, tested Charles White's uh, program that he has been working on for like six years on Excel for the WN Best Combustion System. And then I 3D modeled and assembled a burner that we used to sell, uh, the rotary cup burner, specifically the VHER burner. So what was what is the Excel file exactly? What is it used for? And where, where, why do we use it? So on the uh, website, you are able to go on there. Interested parties can go on there. And it just lists off a couple of different things. And you will, uh, they would fill in like the blanks like this, this, and change like natural gas or number two fuel to whatever type of fuel they're trying to run in the burner system for this. And they answer all these questions. And then at the end, they contact the company and it prints them out. I think it's like 35 pages on eight and a half by 11 of like the spec output. And it just lists off all the like the code that they have to meet and everything they have to put in for that. And so my job was, as I would go in the setup and I would change mainly just the blue ones. This isn't the full piece of paper. It's just a section. Couldn't get a picture of it because it's too big. Um, I would change just the blue, and then I would check the spec output and make sure that it matched so that if they put in the information, they would get the right results. And so I was testing that. And originally, when they came to me with this thing, I had no idea what I was doing. So I read the whole spec output like all the way through, and it's like 30, uh, 250 lines of paragraphs on Excel. And uh, I did that and still didn't know what I was doing. So then I went to talk to Charles, and he kind of explained to me a little bit more. And once again, I just would read the spec output and find any mistakes. And I didn't find any, so. <laughs> I read it like 11 times, and I found no mistakes with all the different tests I did. So it was, it was pretty impressive. And it was pretty cool. So I learned a lot just about like the burners and different qualifications that they have to have in the field and like some of the code that they have to keep for that. And then my second project was modeling and assembly of the BHER burner. So I was working really a lot with Simon on this project. And when we first were given the project, I was working on the thing for Charles. So Simon kind of like assembled most of the like online files into a folder that we could like access all the PDFs of it. And then we were like, okay, Dan said, just start modeling them for on SolidWorks. And we were like, all right, I haven't used SolidWorks in a long time. So I went to model it and I started with this piece right here. And it's just the spacer. And I said, this will be easy. And I looked through, uh, actually Ricky came and gave us a folder and it had all the drawings that we needed to model. And I looked through it, and some of them looked like this. And I said, I will never be able to model that because I don't know what that looks like. And so most of them looked like that. And I just flipped through that book a whole bunch of times trying to find all the easy ones. <laughs> and then I finished that. And this is the piece that's modeled. And I think that's accurate. I had to guess a little bit on the top because it, the file was cut off. And for those of you who don't know, some of these drawings were done in like 1960. So they're very hard to read and they're scanned in and some of the paper, the lines were like missing. So you kind of have to get the ruler out and measure and make sure everything lines up. So I spent a lot of time doing different pieces of that. And I would say about like two weeks ago, I was able to get it into an assembly. So start making it look like one that we have actually out in the back. It looks pretty similar to that. There's a couple pieces missing that we weren't able to finish. Um, and so this is like model, this is like the side view of the burner and you would have like, uh, this would be the housing piece that I designed earlier that you saw. And it actually holds a worm gear in it that uh, powers the pump and everything for that. So learn that. Um, this is the cut view. You can kind of see just the amount of different pieces we had to work with and stuff like that. 
And this is actually the Simon designed this piece, and it's actually a pretty cool piece. It took him a couple of days, but the drawing for that, I still don't think I could design it because it was pretty impressive. So, and then so what was learned um, uh, from reading the spec outputs from Charles, I kind of got a small understanding of the combustion system install installation, whether it was new or retrofit, kind of just how that worked. And then I became very proficient in my SolidWorks modeling on um, that. And then Dan actually took me and Simon out and explained how the rotary cup burner worked. And it was pretty cool to see just the different pieces, how they work, and like, oh, I designed that, and that's what it does. So I was appreciative of that. That's it. All right. Uh, questions? <laughs> So, do we we get every part of BHE done? Almost there. We got uh, got the heater manifold that we have to get out of the shed and then measure by hand and model. But, uh, other than that, it's all cool. That's an impressive feat. That is an impressive feat, and it's very important. This is a burner that we've uh, basically stopped manufacturing, but there are applications that we come across from time to time where we would need the rotary cup technology. And so to preserve the design, uh, we had to go through this process. So it's not like we assigned you guys busy work, but you saw the condition of some of those drawings too, right? And it was a little alarming to hear that some of them cut off and we had to... <laughs> That's what I said. I mean, they had to take their ruler and actually, you know, measure the drawing, develop a scale based on what the drawing was versus what it actually measured, and then use that to get the dimensions they need. Um, so the drafting class they took in freshman year paid off. Paid off, okay. Yeah, and, and, and so, uh, yeah, so what we're doing is we're preserving the design of that burner because that burner, things kind of come around in our industry sometimes. And uh, what we want to do is, is that. So this is something we've been talking about here for a long time. And the thought that we have is mostly done is, uh, is, is great. Um, uh, yeah, and then what I just wanted to, as you guys were putting this together, you saw that everything is driven off that worm gear, mm -hmm. right? So two pumps in the reservoir assembly and the rotary cup and the primary air fan are all driven off of that. And uh, from an efficiency standpoint, today you can't beat uh, the energy input and the result output that you get from the rotary burner. We can't we can't get that on air or you know uh, air atomized burners. Uh, you have to use much more horsepower. So uh, anyhow, that's excellent. Uh, any other comments or questions? Just comment. How much did the 3D scanner help you? So for the, I specifically left it off because the 3D scanner I found doesn't work good with small pieces. Right. So like a lot of the videos you see them like doing online when we research how to use it, they're big. And anytime we did like a big object, it looks really good and scans it very good track it, but every time we would do something with lots of detail, something small, it would miss parts of it, and it would almost be not useful in like, it would be easier to design it without drawings, with anything, just measuring it, sure. than it would be to try to fix the drawing that the scanner puts in, because it would put in sure. wrong parts, and it would pick up objects not on. So, so I wonder if there's a scanner, a scanner that, that is for small objects. I think there is. Yeah. Yeah. We just we need to get a different one. Yeah. And like they have a turntable yeah. that you use, yeah. but I found that when you use the turntable, it doesn't pick up whatever is sitting on the turntable. So it only picks up like the walls of it and like the top. But if it has like an opening, um, let me see. Nope, can't see it. I was going to show you a piece we tried to do it on, but it wasn't picking up the bottom. And it was a hard piece to design, but because it doesn't put the bottom in there on the 3D scanner, it's not like helpful. Because really. it doesn't give you like the depth right. that you need on it. So 
So, so what's small and big? Like small. Um. Like, so like. Like, a soda can or like we did me. They we scanned myself in, and I look really good on the scan. After. But everything like the pieces that we were designing specifically for this were very small. I think maybe like the manifold. We don't have that piece. Maybe you could try to do that. But also, it's very reliant on color. So black objects, they can't pick up. So if like a lot of the objects we were scanning were the wrong color, and it would be like, oh, this isn't picking it up. Like it doesn't see it here. And we would play with the light, like the lighting on it, and it like might get parts, but it would miss stuff. So it doesn't have to be on the turntable. No, like they have three different types of way to scan, like the turntable. Um, a handheld, and then a rapid handheld, and I found like I like the rapid handheld the best, be just because of how much faster it is compared to the handheld. Otherwise, you're just slowing, and it would keep telling us, "Oh, you're missing an object," or "I can't follow this object around like the diameter." Or something. So, so uh, if you had a larger item, did, did it have trouble picking up small details on an overall larger item, or? It, Not it, really, like it picked up, obviously it can't get inside, like a, if it's a hole that goes all the way through like a big object, it's not going to get that hole, like going okay. all the way through. But it will put the hole and it will put an indent in it, so you can't see it, like inside. But no, it picks up the details on larger objects fairly well from my experience. Obviously, we, for this, we didn't use it a lot, so we played around with it, especially at the beginning, and then when we got it back, we tried it on parts. But we haven't done like a ton of large uh, objects, just a couple. And from what I've seen, it works very well with those. Okay. And then you can you can clean it up a little bit after it's scanned, or yes, you can actually like I'm not a hundred percent sure, but you can like yeah make lines on it and like say go to here and here, and then you can actually do multiple scans and then like merge the scans two together. Very good. Thank you very much. Um, so I'm sorry, I apologize ahead of time. You're going to hear a lot of what he just said because uh, we didn't team up on this one, and uh, but we did basically do the same thing. Um, so my name is Simon Phillips. I also go to Pensacola Christian College, and I'm about to be a junior uh, mechanical engineer student this year. So my summer intern projects, um, two major ones. Uh, the second one, um, finding a new read switch for the uh, preferred level switch. I'm still working on that, so I don't quite have a resolution to that project. But I 3D modeled the rotary cup burner, and I did some smaller jobs, like solid work drawings, like Brian Plessy would come to my desk, and he would throw something down on it with a drawing and say, draw this and send it to me. And I would draw and send it to him, and that would be about the last thing I heard. And um, I did some boiler modifications for Gustavo for different projects he was working on. So the way I heard it from Dan, he had me come to his office, he explained the project to me. He said the problem is there are still hundreds of rotary cup burners still in use today. And uh, there's still quite a big opportunity for aftermarket sales, but there weren't any uh, digital compilations of the 2D drawings or any of the assemblies. Um, there were no individual Excel files for each uh, sub-assembly. There was one very, very, very big Excel file that if you wanted to go through, you could definitely find what you're looking for. It just take you a very long time. And there were uh, no 3D model parts assemblies. So we went through, we located all the drawings, and we um, assembled them all in one folder. So if anybody needs to find a certain folder, it's going to be easily accessible based on the number. And you can see there are Excel files, and you can click on those in each subassembly and find each uh, necessary part and how many are required for each. Uh, next, we just started modeling. That was, just like Joe, um, one of the parts that I looked at and I said, can't imagine. We started flipping through that book and we said, can't do it. Nope, can't do it. And we went through and did all the spacers. 
And so that was the piece that I modeled for that. And um, just like with the 2D drawings, we put them all into their own file and their own folder of uh, 3D model parts for easy access. Uh, next thing was making assembly. Uh, this time I had started working on the next stage of the, um, I mean, on the re-switch project. So Joe kind of spearheaded this. He did a lot of the assembling and um, started with, thankfully there were 2D drawings of the assembly. So based on that, we were able to put pieces like this together into assemblies like that and um, eventually come together with the main burner assembly. And the heater manifold is going to run right along here for those of you who do know what it looks like and how, uh, how it works on the burner. So Dan came to me with the, helping out in this project about a week and a half ago and he starts off with talking about a read switch and while he's telling me what the project is, that's about the only thing that was running through my mind was, oh, it's a read switch. He kept saying a read switch. <laughs> and uh, he was like, so why don't you just go ahead and spend some time looking up what a read switch is. And I said, I will do that, Dan. <laughs> so a read switch is an electrical switch that opens or closes a circuit when it's introduced to a magnetic field. So this is um, what is, there are multiple, there are different types of uh, read switches, but this is the type that we work with. So when a magnet comes near the read switch, and it will close, depending on if it's a um, normally open or normally closed read switch. And what we need it for is uh, they u they're used in the preferred level switch. And the one that we're working with is uh, used in a day tank or possibly the overflow part of the day tank. And that if fuel, oil, anything that is used for a day gen uh, generator in the day tank, if it overflows and it makes that magnet rise, the reed switch is on the inside of that shaft and it'll close the circuit and it'll make sure that there's no overflow because it's pretty, uh, pretty important. So, or it'll turn a pump on to fill the tank mm -hmm. that's gotten empty. Right. So, um, current reed switch that we're being used has been made obsolete. So we need to find a suitable replacement and one that would be guaranteed to have no issues and not fail. So selecting the new read switch, I've been working with Jake Powell on this, and they come in all sorts of different sizes, small, big, and uh, finding the correct specifications that match the one we use has been a little difficult because nothing matches correctly. So we have ordered a few different types uh, from a few different companies, and the next step in the project will be testing to see which ones work the best and if they have any breaking points to make sure that we can find the best next suitable option and possible secondary option just in case this next one becomes obsolete as well. So conclusion, um, I was able to use a lot of Excel and I learned a ton from it and um, definitely became more proficient in SolidWorks. I'm very Excellent. thankful for that as a necessary skill <laughs> and um, allowed for more experience with working as a team. Uh, me and Joe, we've been able to coordinate and it's uh, taught me a lot with working with another person. That's uh, it's my presentation. All right, great. Questions? So the read switch, we're having a trouble finding it because it was made in 1942. And by the way, 1960 is not old, Joe. <laughs> 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 uh, right? I mean, that is just a little while. <laughs> but yes. Uh, they don't make them anymore, they're obsolete. So, you know, we have to so find probably the, the newer ones look different because there's been a few, um, there's been some progress in the read switch world. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, manufacturing capabilities and performance and, and all that. And then this is a common thing that happens with our products. You know, even though the whole product is we're still selling, maybe a part of it is obsolete, especially in electronics. So, it, this is a constant thing that comes up where. We have to replace an obsolete processor, obsolete switch, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, this is something you'll likely see help you know, later on in your career as well. Yeah, good. Um, and uh, um, oh, the enhancement to, of, uh, yeah. That, that's a whole other part. We have all the drawings and all the information. If you knew 
where to look, mm -hmm. you know, uh, for the preferred rotary cup burner. And, you know, this is why er uh, Ricky Erickson's been working here for 53 years, is because he cannot retire because all this knowledge is just, it only exists in his head. Yeah, right. So we're little by little trying to get it down, um, you know, in a format and in a, uh, uh, in a document form that can last, uh, as opposed to paper out and shed, right. and uh, also can be utilized by people that don't do it every day, right? This would be a this would be something that somebody might do twice a year, right. or you know three times a year. It might be a big parts order from a that New York City Housing Authority, mm -hmm. right. and then you know the last time somebody had to deal with that was two years ago. You know, and so to be able to go to a file system, not we're not making rotary burners all the time, so it isn't like oh yeah, just get the part one three six two R, you know, or whatever. So the thing is, is uh, that that's hugely important because uh, it's a product that we're supporting. Um, there's very intermittent use, and uh, if we decide to use it again on a product like. Um, bioresidual fuel or something like that, um, you know, we need to know how to make it. Because the guys out in the shop and the engineers aren't in the business of making rotary burners really now at all. So very important uh, and, and good job to both of you. Very good. working on, like I said, quality control. I uh, did some uh, building layout drawings for Dwayne Holden. Uh, Rob asked me to build a heat load calculator, which I'll go into later. Uh, and then CADLINK, which was kind of my encompassing uh, project this summer. Um, we're doing a whole new uh, update to our uh, drawing system. So quality control, obviously Marshall went into this. Uh, this is where I started this summer. Well, when we got back from school early, uh, was testing and checking off panels, um, just running through that whole process that Marshall ran you through. Um, and then he worked on switches. Uh, there was a five week period where we were about to get slammed, and then there was uh, a lot of prep that we needed to do before that. Um, so Marshall set up all of those switches that he showed you. Um, what I did was I built, I believe we only had two of these out in the shop, one of these was working. Uh, right now there are four that are uh, completely set up and working. So that was just kind of a little prep that we did before QC started to get slammed uh, with cabinets and, and fuel oil. Um, so that was my quality control. And then <clears throat> I started coming into, I came back into engineering. Um, this was presented to me later on uh, this summer, a couple of weeks back by Dwayne um, and then Rob as well. These were uh, new electrical runs that were going to be putting into the shop uh, in the next couple weeks, months. Um, basically what this is doing is uh, distributing power throughout the company for future design projects. Um, for instance, our second floor that we're going to be putting in soon. Um, so just running a 480 bus all the way through the machine shop um, and then just making sure everything um, has enough power where it's needed. Uh, it's just easy plug-in access. Um, it's a more exploded view of uh, a couple of different things that are going on there. Um, then uh, Dwayne asked me. Dwayne asked me to go through because we're reorganizing uh, most of the main floor. Um, 
and we're going to be putting all new stuff up at the second floor. So this was just kind of rearranging this building. This building is going to get taken down to the foundation and rebuilt in two story. Yes. Yeah. So uh, what we're doing is just kind of reorganizing where different departments are going to be. Um, and so we just have you go through and make a couple changes here. Uh, and then I believe he sent this off to an uh, architectural engineer just to kind of confirm uh, what's going on. You need to speak a little louder. <laughs> and so uh, this is just an exploded view of that. Um, like I said, Rob uh, Frohawk asked me to build a heat load calculator. Um, so what this is uh, going to do for us um, is it's going to take the um, it's going to have an input of, you, it'll have inputs of the dimension of the cabinet. Um, what it's going to yield is, you know, your total surface area, um, as well as your surf, uh, surface area allowing your heat transfer. Um, and I put in two settings as your back mounted and your bottom mounted because those are two of the more standard uh, ways that we mount our cabinets. Um, what this is going to do is take those inputs, generate those values. Um, you have also inputs over here. Um, which are your interior uh, enclosure temperature, uh, your ambient temperature outside, um, your max temperature allowed in the cabinet. Um, your max temperature allowed inside the cabinet is just based off of what the uh, maximum temperature that any of the components within the cabinet can withhold, and then you just probably back it down um, just to get a good safe distance in between those values. So a lot of this, um, and, then, and then you have your internal heat load, which you can calculate as well um, based off of those components. I have that in watts and B2 uh, as well. Um, so what you do is you take uh, all of those inputs, uh, you plug in whatever you need to plug in, uh, and you'll generate your internal heat rise, which Rob Frohawk taught me that uh, when you find your internal heat load, um, you take 5 to 10% of what that number is, and that is what your uh, internal heat rise temperature would be. I, I did about 6.5% right here, um, but uh, naturally, usually it's uh, between 5 or 10% is what the temperature uh, rise will be within the cabinet. Um, this temperature differential in BTU per hour per uh, feet squared, um, this was something that I actually had to generate by myself, uh, that it, it's an if and statement. Um, where you go through, I actually had to, there was nothing on this. Um, I had to find a, I found a chart online that did just a minimal uh, range. Um, what this allowed me to do was, uh, I extrapolated on both ends of the range so that we could fit uh, the temper, temperature differential in between them. Um, and what this did is it converted that temperature differential into that BTU per hour food squared. This allowed me to find uh, the heat load transfer and the cooling capacity as well. Um, so this was all completely generated by myself, which took a while. Um, so uh, this consisted of using your finding your U value, um, calculating total heat and loss gain. Uh, you input uh, various temperatures based on the customer specs, what they want. Um, and then you can calculate the cubic foot uh, per minute that you need to to uh, cool the inside of the cabinet, um, as well as obtain, you know, obtaining and keeping the appropriate spec uh, max temperature within the cabinet. So that's all completely built. I sent that off to Rob. We still have to check that out. I'm sure there are a few tweaks and stuff that we have to work out. But for the most part, that's done. Um, and then CadLink was where I lived for the majority of the summer. Um, what this is is basically uh, a new type of uh, drawing um, design that we're going to handle is uh, all of these blocks right here. So for instance, this is a uh, coil um, for a relay. Um, all of this data that you see right down here, item quantity one, and all of this item quantity two. Um, this is called the CAD link data. So to run you through the process really quick of creating one of these blocks, so every single relay that you see uh, on the drawing will look like this. Um, and it will have the terminal number. Um, I'm talking to Luke about putting this ID number in here as far as whether it's R1, R2, R3, and so forth. Um, your tag as far as what it actually does in the drawing. 
uh, your terminal numbers and what it's referencing. Um, so that's all inputted, um, and I did the research on the manufacturer and uh, what these terminals actually are as far as you know what their power is, and, and we'll go into more of that later. I'll show you more blocks. But all this CAD link data, all of this is pulled off of Intuitive. Um, you have your manufacturer, your uh, ID number, what we have at, as as Intuitive, your manufacturing ID number, uh, your manufacturing part number, um, your VIN number, and your lead time. So. Um, this is the actual component for this particular block. This is the actual component, and then this would be this CAD link data would uh, encapsulate the uh, mounting bracket that we would have on the uh, cabinet on the panel. Um, a couple more of these blocks. This is a free position handoff auto switch um, with all of its reference data and whatnot. This is a fuse. Um, this is a, uh, I believe this is a surge suppressor. Um, so essentially what all of this does is we will are uh, going to be inputting it. So for instance right here I have a PLC um, input card right here. Um, and what it does is uh, as we create these blocks and introduce the cat link data, um, we, input the cat, we input the block, we run an insert command in the drawing, input the block in. And what it does is it auto-generates all this data along the sidebar and the properties so that when we do end up running the build material, um, instead of having to go through and see, run through the build material, see what we need on it, put it into the drawing, we can just build the drawing and it'll auto-generate the build material with everything that we have in this drawing. So what it does is it essentially cuts down all of the time that the engineer takes uh, needing to uh, compare both of uh, the, uh, the build material and the drawing, and you know, all he has to do is just build this, and it'll auto generate the bomb for him. That gets rid of some scribal errors, too, right? Yes. Yeah. So, here also, these are um, normally open uh, relays. Uh, again, you know, all of this data right here, uh, it is generated in the block that you made prior. So, whenever you run the insert command, you go through your library that we've built um, and find whatever you need to find, insert it, um, click enter a couple of times, um, maybe change a couple of properties around. So for instance, this B1 VOR, um, all the terminals for these should be the same. And then your reference coil here. Um, and it just helps kind of uh, standardize everything that we're going to be doing in our drawing. Um, these are the benefits. So we'll have a full library when we're done with this, which we are almost done. Uh, we'll have a full library of standardized parts, um, just different parts. So um, for instance, this Gwinnett job that we're doing, we are actually introducing a lot of Allen Bradley uh, parts. So we've, I've actually had to go through and make a whole new library of these Allen Bradley parts for this Gwinnett job. So we have the, all of those for future jobs at our disposal. Um, CAD link data to Unite. Uh, for a specific part to a draft site block. Um, what it does is it auto-generates auto terminal numbers and auto block and block descriptions and tags. Um, this little uh, picture right here basically shows you exactly what CADLINK does for us. It, uh, combines the, uh, it connects the CADLINK um, drawing that you have um, and your ERP uh, system that you have set up. Um, so it eliminates the bomb drawing comparison for accurate lineup. So it's going to be very useful someday when it's fully set up and running. We actually have a couple of jobs that are already using this, so it's been very helpful, I believe. Uh, so lessons learned. Um, attention to detail, obviously, quick and efficient quality control procedures in the beginning of months, uh, producing quality testing materials with the plain white controller. Um, additional experience in Excel, I've actually I taken st uh, statistics. There's only so much that you can learn, but uh, generating that heat log calculator um, really kind of opened my eyes to how much Excel can do um, and what, you know, what is possible. Um, so, and understanding heat transfer calculations and equation of application as well, uh, proficiency, in, proficiency in the path link drum, uh, future experience in draft site, uh, further experience in draft site and to develop tool drawings, uh, kind of encapsulates everything that I've done this summer. And that is pretty much it, so thank you for her. Uh, and 
great to be working with you all yet again. So that's my presentation. If you have any questions, um, <clears throat> I'd like to get a, <clears throat> a sense from these guys. What, what are we looking at the pick up time in terms of uh, efficiency? Um, I think initially that you know, as we develop the, the blocks and that, we may not pick up time, but our accuracy is better. Okay. Um, and then as we develop more and more blocks that we don't have to uh, create because we're using a new part, you know, and have to take the time to do that. Once we're building a drawing completely from parts that are already in the library, then that's where we pick up the right to it. Sure. Initially, it's going to be more time. Yeah. Because of the investment, but. More time, higher accuracy. Higher accuracy, but in the long term, we're going to see a steady reduction in time. Yeah. And then definitely improving accuracy. Yeah. Good. There's a whole library full of files, on files of blocks that have already been made. So we're 90% of the way there, I feel like. Um, we can pretty much work on these constantly, whenever it needs a new part. So we're almost there. Excellent. <clears throat> Any other questions? All right, good job, Rick.